All right, y'all. This is our second to last evening together, so bask it in, um, at least in meetings like this. Hopefully it's not the last time we ever see each other, but hopefully you're all still alive and kicking and, you know, doing well. But uh, what I'd like to do is pray, and uh, then we're going to go into kind of an introduction for this evening's message. Sweet Jesus, thank you for loving us, for blessing us through all these meetings we've had together. And as we reflect upon your love for humanity, and as we hear you bear your own heart with us this evening, I pray that we would have ears to hear and that we would have hearts that would respond. Show us your glory now, I pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this evening we're going to be addressing uh, how that battle between good and evil in our second message that we talked about together directly impacts God on an emotional level and how that can help us to fall even more deeply in love with Him and to find sympathy for what He faces when His people reject Him. There is a fancy theological term that's used by people who are theologians. It's called hermeneutics. It's our means of interpreting Scripture. And there's varying views and discussions about that field of Bible interpretation. But one of the chiefest ways in which we interpret Scripture is based upon the worldview that we have. And if we have an unhealthy picture of God in our minds, we're going to read into Scripture unhealthy pictures of God. Does that make sense? Someone kind of gave us this Turner burn, fire and brimstone theology. We're going to be looking for that as we're studying Scripture. But if we come into Scripture with an understanding that God is love, then everything in Scripture is going to sing that chorus from Genesis to Revelation. And I think it's very, very important because there's this unfortunate dichotomy that's shared by people. uh, And maybe you've heard this before, even kind of wrestled with this. It's It's a God of fire and wrath in the Old Testament, and then a God of love in the New Testament, kind of wrestling with what to do with that seeming tension. Uh, I want to address that tonight by using primarily Old Testament texts where God himself is speaking to address that very idea. I think it's very, very important to us. We talked about this in multiple meetings that uh, God's special church at the end of the time is going to value and uplift the principles of the Old Testament. And yet principles, Jesus says, the principles of the Old Testament are testifying of him. And so there should be this harmonious relationship between testifying of Jesus and the Old Testament. So I'd like to do that tonight and address that. Um, So we addressed in our second meeting together this idea that God did not create evil and that God is going to put an end to it. And that's a blessing, but there's kind of a problem if that's the only argument that we make. We made more arguments than that. But if that's the only argument that's made, the problem is there's this big swath of time from the fall of Lucifer until the second coming of Jesus and particularly to the end of the millennium, uh, when the entire world is made new and evil is fully destroyed, we can kind of wrestle with, yeah, but what's he doing right now? Like, are you literally just saying, okay, I didn't start it, but I'll finish it later, and you're just sitting on your hands? Like, what is God doing in this intervening time? And I think it's very, very important because there's a lot of suffering in between those two points in time, and what is he doing, and what's his experience through it all? So, without any further ado, in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 23, it says, this is God again himself speaking, do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? And in Ezekiel 33, 11, it says, say to them, as I live, says the Lord, and how long has he lived? From everlasting to everlasting, he says, I have how much pleasure in the death of the wicked? No No pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? I don't want to lose you, he's saying. I don't take pleasure in the destruction of the wicked at the end of time. That's not what I want to do. It's what I have to do. I'm duty bound to remove this evil influence from the universe. But I don't want you to be there. Are, are, you, are you with me in that? If you remember in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, Jesus says, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Your name is not on that list. He doesn't want you to be there. 2 Peter 3, 9, this is the New Testament, but just a brief reference here. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Like, why hasn't God come yet? He's not slack, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, 
and but that all should come to repentance. So God is bearing long, right? The reason why he hasn't come yet is because he's trying to get more in that city before that door eventually closes. Now, God does not rejoice over the death of anyone, right? You can't create something out of love and then take enjoyment in destroying it, right? That's a contradiction in terms. That's not the way that God operates. But I want to go to text down Isaiah chapter 5. That's a really important text we'll be covering and re-referring to throughout the course of this evening. Isaiah chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones, and he planted it with what type of vine? The choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it, obviously, to bring forth good grapes. But instead, what did it bring forth? Wild grapes. This is a poisonous fruit. But first of all, notice that God is clearing the stones out of the ground. Now, why would you clear stones out of the ground of your garden? Why would you do that? To make a way for something great. To make a way for something great? Okay, what else? To have good soil. You want to remove the things that would hinder its growth, right? Removing those things. In fact, one of the curses that would happen in Israel when they would you know, defeat their enemies sometimes, they would put a bunch of rocks in their fields and they would dig up the trees and throw salt in the field. Like they would do stuff to kind of limit its fruitfulness. What God is doing is the opposite of that. He's removing what would hinder its growth. And this is what all the reforms of Scripture are about, by the way. Whenever God has those reforms he wants for our life, we talked about diet reform, right? And God's intention for that or the things we watch or that we listen to or the things we wear or so forth. God's not looking to be this narcissist who just wants to control your life. He's trying to remove those things that make your heavenward journey more difficult. Are you with me tonight? This is super important. Every reform in the Bible is to help your growth become easier, right? That's the purpose of it. So he wanted to bring forth good grapes, and he planted it with the choicest vine. The best potential that there is in a vine was given, and yet it produced poisonous fruit. In verse 3, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. And then he asks a very important question. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? The question God will ask people at the end of the day is, what more could I have done for you? I gave everything. What more could I have done to see you inside of this city? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I'll take away its hedge, its means of protection, and it shall be burned. I'll break down its wall, again, its means of protection, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns, and I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is who? The house of Israel, God's people. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. God was looking for good results, but in turn found oppression and terrible results. And God has done whatever it took for them to thrive and grow, but instead they turn into this poisonous plant, and He asks again the question, what more could I have done? Now, some would say that God could stop it from happening. So let's look at Genesis chapter 2. Okay, Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. This is before the fall of man. Genesis 2 and verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it I will kill you. Is that what the text says? No, he says that in the day you eat of it you will surely die. There are consequences of this decision. God is warning beforehand, you don't want to go there. There are heavy and difficult consequences. But what do Adam and Eve do? They eat of it anyway. Now, can God be blamed for that? If God literally tells them, if you do this, these things will happen, is God responsible for the consequences? No, because he tried to spare them of the consequences with the warning that he gave in the first place, right? That's what's happening here. God was without blame in this. And you can imagine God coming up to Adam and Eve right after this thing happened 
and he would say the same thing as he did in Isaiah chapter 5. Like, what, what more could I have done? Like, I, I literally told you this is a possible consequence. This is the consequence of this, right? I, I did what I could do. I told you this would happen. Now, you've heard that it was said, or you've maybe heard people say that I'm not going down without a fight. You ever heard that before? Well, I would phrase it this way. God's not going to let you go down without a fight. Amen? God does not want people to be lost. This is why He won't leave you alone. This, me- this evening's topic is entitled, Why God Won't Leave. This is why He doesn't leave you alone. In those wandering years, you always had that sense that I know I'm not supposed to be here. And it was like there was always something calling you back home. And maybe for some of us, we don't even know where that home is, but we know that where we are isn't home. How many people can testify to that in those wandering years? You know that you're not, this is not home right? That's why God is doing this, because He has something better to offer us, okay? And so God provided a voice of reason to them. It happens again in Genesis chapter 4. In Genesis chapter 4, we have the the offspring of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. Both of them offered sacrifices before the Lord. Cain offered the fruit of the ground. Abel offered the fruit of the flock. Now, the whole purpose of the sacrifice was to be a type of Christ, if you remember, right? All the sacrifices were about Jesus, Well, plants didn't represent Jesus, right? So he offered the wrong sacrifice, and he wasn't favored for it. God honored Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain's. And Cain was livid. He was upset. Now, God told him what to offer, but he says, I'm going to do things my way. I know what you said, but I'm still going to do me. And then he gets upset because God doesn't favor what he said would be favored. So God literally condescends to speak to this man in Genesis chapter 4. I'd encourage you to read it later. But he says, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if not, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. But then he says, but you should have mastery over it. He literally tells him, I know what you're thinking, Cain. And you don't have to do this. He's thinking of killing his brother right now. He's super upset that his brother was favored and he wasn't. He's thinking of murdering him and he's angry at God. And God says, why? If you do what I've asked, you're going to be accepted. And what I'm asking is reasonable. And if you don't, sin lies at the door and his desire is for you, but you don't have to do this, Cain. You should have mastery over it. What does he do in Genesis 4? Anyone know? He kills his brother anyway. God literally condescends and has this hostage negotiation with him, and he kills his brother anyway. And God asks him, where's your brother? He says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? If you've ever heard that phrase before, am I my brother's keeper? It's where it comes from. And he says, your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. I know what's happened. But God gave a voice of reason to Cain before he did it. Did he have to do that? Was there any legally binding document that said, here I, God, hereby declare that I have to do this? But no. It's not there. The only legally binding document is the only principle that God works by, and that is love. That's why He does it. He doesn't want people to be lost. So in Genesis 2 and Genesis 4, a literal voice of reason from God Himself was given. Eventually you have Moses and the patriarchs, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of them. God was speaking through them. Then the prophets throughout the Old Testament. And Hebrews 11 tells us that the prophets were killed, they were stoned, they were sawn in two, and they were left for dead. The people didn't listen to the prophets. And so for 400 years at the close of the Old Testament chronology, there were no prophets in Israel. The Holy Spirit ceased out of Israel for 400 years regarding the prophetic gift. No one was speaking on behalf of God. But then John the Baptist shows up preaching a powerful message of repentance, pointing people to Jesus who's to come. Jesus himself is serving as that voice of reason, clarifying and uplifting the law. Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, but I say to you. And you've heard that it was said, but I say to you. Giving a clear voice of reason to the world of his day. Then Jesus promises in John chapter 16 that the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Right? Convicting the world of their unbelief, right? That Jesus is their only possible source of righteousness. They cannot be righteous on their own. And lastly, a judgment's coming where all these things matter. He's giving that voice of reason to the world. And then in Revelation chapter 14, those three angels' messages we've alluded to multiple nights, he gives that last message of mercy to the world. In Revelation 18, a final message of mercy to the world. God has literally afforded a voice of reason throughout salvation history. Why? Why? because he doesn't want to leave his people without a way of escape. 
He doesn't want to leave his people without a plan of salvation and a way to have something better in their lives. And that's why that voice always tells us this isn't a good idea. And those things that we knew that we shouldn't have done, that's why that voice is there to spare us from the heartbreak, to spare, to spare us from the hardship and the consequences. God's trying to protect us from that. He can't control your free will, right? Love requires freedom. And with freedom, there's a risk. God can give us, He can reason with us. But if we choose to do me anyway, then He's going to have to allow us to bear those consequences. Does that make sense? And many times He hopes that those consequences will lead us back to Him. But sometimes it doesn't. For some of us, we just harden ourselves even more. But again, who says God has to go through all of this? This shows how much God wants you to be saved, and it shows us that God is not passive during this great conflict. He's laboring for every single soul and providing a voice of reason to equip us to succeed. Amen? God's not leaving us on our own. But not only does He give us a voice of reason, He's also promised to give us power to live a holy life. We read this text earlier in some of our meetings. Ezekiel 36, verse 22, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this, what I'm about to do for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you profaned among the nations wherever you went. The nation of Israel had made God's name blasphemous to the foreign nations. Verse 23, And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you've profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God. How? When I'm hallowed in you before their eyes. In short, when you look like Jesus. Because right now, you don't. But this is the amazing thing. Even though the very people He hired to win the world are making God's name be blasphemed among the nations, he still wants to change their lives. Amen? There's hope for us, beloved. He still wants to change their lives. So how's he going to do that? Because it certainly hasn't worked to now. This is what he says in verse 24. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and I'll bring you into your own land. Then I'll sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. All those things you're running to, to escape God, to escape accountability, to escape responsibility. He says, I'll cleanse you from that, whatever it is. Drugs, relationships, alcohol, other addictions, other unhealthy habits and mindsets and worldviews. He says, I'll cleanse you from all of that. I'll cleanse you. I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'll take the heart of stone out of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll give you the ability to be able to feel again. To have some form of desire for the things of God. To have some form of sympathy for your fellow man. Is the world hard-hearted today? Absolutely. But God says, I can change that. Then he says, I'll put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. I'll even empower you to obey. And just think about this, beloved. He's not only offering us a voice of reason to help us make good decisions. He's even offering a, a, the power of heaven to walk in those good decisions, right? To live a holy and changed life. But again, who says God has to do this? He could have put a sign on the wall that says, warning, no lifeguard on duty, swim at your own risk, right? The Ten Commandments are on the wall, and if you walk in it, great. If not, it's on you, pal. He doesn't do that. God is literally willing to do this. He doesn't want us to be lost. He's doing everything in His power to woo us and to set us free, but He leaves the choice to us. So in Ezekiel chapter 36, we see God's extravagant desire to see us saved. He says, you're dirty, I'll cleanse you. You got idols, I can get rid of them. You have a stony heart, I'll give you a new one. You're cold and indifferent, I'll help you to feel again. You can't obey, I'll empower you to obey. And so his response is, you got any more objections? What's left for me to do? Like literally, I'm willing to take responsibility for all of this, but I cannot control the choices that you make. I can let you know this isn't a good choice, and I can offer you a way of escape, and I can offer you power to take that way of escape. But if you never listen, if you keep doing you, then you're literally limiting the all-powerful God of the universe, because the only thing He can't do is make your choices for you. Are you with me? He can't do that. Nor does he want to, because love doesn't work that way. Love doesn't work by force and coercion and, and puppetry, right? It gives free will. What makes the vows so beautiful at the altar when the woman says, I do, is that she had every free right to say, I don't, but I'm choosing to stay. That's true love, and that's how God operates. So the people who are lost at the end of time are not lost because God did not make ample provision. It's not because God didn't do enough, 
right? Again, he'll tell them, what more could I have done for you? They're lost because they had no desire to take him up on his amazing offer. Many of us are shaming ourselves out of heaven. I'm a loser. I'm not good enough. I'm so comfortable with the bad choices I've been making for years that it's scary and difficult to make different decisions, right? Because some of us, Dr. Brene Brown phrases it this way. She's a specialist on shame. She says, it's easier to live disappointed than to be disappointed. For some of us, it's easier to live a life of chaos because at least we know what to expect and it's what we feel that we deserve than to make choices that would better us and better the people we love and cherish the most because we don't feel that we're good enough. We're afraid of change, right? And so we just stay on that cycle of chaos and God is saying, it doesn't have to look this way. I can change that, but will you reach out and, let, and, and take hold of me and trust me? And some of us are letting the devil himself do it, those voices that come into our head that say, you're a loser, you're not good enough, no one loves you, no one cares about you, I can't believe you just did that again, God certainly won't forgive you. All those voices don't come from God. And sometimes we have voices of unbelief from the people who love us the most. Some of us are being shamed and abused by people who should be leading us in the right. God says, I don't work that way. They may, but I don't. And they may call that love. I never did. Are you with me? And so as it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10, they did not receive the love of the truth that they, not, that they might be saved. They wouldn't receive it. They'd rather believe a lie than take hold of God's belief in them. All right, more narrative from God in the Old Testament. This is Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 20. He says, Declare this in the house of Jacob and proclaim it in Judah, saying, Hear this now, O foolish people, without understanding, who have eyes and see not, who have ears and hear not. Do you not fear me, says the Lord? And he's not talking about abject fear. He's talking about respect and reverence. He says, will you not tremble at my presence who placed the sand as the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass beyond it? And though its waves toss to and fro, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. But this people has a defiant and rebellious heart. They revolted and departed. He's saying the very things of nature should give us reason to worship and to serve Him. How many people have ever just been, had their breath taken away by the things of nature? You ever seen that? A majestic eagle soaring in the sky, beautiful mountainside, or a sunrise, or a sunset. He says those themselves should give us ample reason to worship Him. In fact, the things of nature are obedient to God. Right? The sun rises when He tells it to. It sets when He tells it to. The seas stop where He tells them to. But His people who are made in His own image, we don't do what He tells us to do. They have said in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God who gives the rain, or they have not said in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God who gives us rain both the former and the latter in its season. God's been faithful to provide for us. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. And then he says something very interesting. He says, your iniquities have turned these things away and your sins have withheld good from you. So notice it's not God that's withholding good from us. It's us. We are voluntarily severing ourselves from the source of blessing. Are you understanding where he's going here? Have you ever had a conversation with somebody and you're trying to reason with them and you're not getting anywhere? You ever, you ever been there? It, you might as well be talking to a brick wall, right? He says this here. He says, um, anyway, I'll skip that. That's actually for the next one. I put these in the wrong place. That happens sometimes. Anyway, I'll skip this. But... In the beginning of these verses, God says that the very things of nature should give us enough reason to worship Him and serve Him, and they're obedient, but His people aren't. And listen to this. This is from the book Radical, Taking Back Your Faith from the American uh, Dream by David Platt. We quoted from this earlier in another presentation. But he says, We spurn our Creator's authority over us. God beckons storm clouds, and they come. He tells the winds to blow and the rain to fall, and they obey immediately. He speaks to the mountains, You go there! And He says to the seas, You stop here! And they do it. Everything in all creation responds in obedience to the Creator until we get to you and me. And we have the audacity to look God in the face and say, no. This is Micah chapter 6, beginning of verse 1. Here's where I wanted to use that other point. It says, Hear now what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint, and you strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a complaint against His people, and He will contend with Israel. 
O my people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Testify against me. Why are you spitting in my face and rebelling like this? I've never done anything wrong to you. What have I done that would lead you to respond in this way? And he's pleading for sympathy of all things. Look what it says here in verse 2. Who's he talking to? He says, Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint, and you strong foundations of the earth. Imagine you're having one of those fruitless conversations with somebody. It's going nowhere. And you just think to yourself, what a waste of my time. And then a third party shows up. You ever been in that scenario? And you kind of look to them for sympathy and just say, are you seeing this craziness? Yeah, God just did that with nature. God is desperate for sympathy in this situation. I, I, I can't reason with them. They won't listen to me. Maybe you listen to me. Maybe you'll have some form of sympathy. He's speaking to inanimate nature. Now, he's not crazy and senile. You understand this is word picture language. But God is asking, what have I done to you that would lead you to treat me this way? I've only loved and blessed you. Why are you rejecting me? And he continues in verse 4, For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, I redeemed you from the house of bondage, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. You know what their role was? To be voices of reason to the nation of Israel. He's shown you, O man, what is good. So I'm your redeemer, I've sent you voices of reason, and I've shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? I'm not asking for much. Show your fellow man mercy and justice and to live a humble life. Walk humbly with me. I'm not asking for much, guys. Jeremiah chapter 6, beginning of verse 16. Again, God speaking here. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. And there you will find rest for your souls. How many people need rest for their souls this evening? Okay, he says, well, listen to me. What do they say? We will not walk in it. We don't want your rest. Also, I set watchmen over you, a voice of reason, saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not listen. We don't want your voice of reason. And it's heartbreaking to him. Continuing in verse 18, he says, Therefore hear you nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will certainly bring calamity on this people. But what is the calamity? the fruit of their thoughts. He removes his means of protection and he turns them over to the consequences of their decisions. Because they have not heeded my words nor my law, but rejected it. And then look at what he says in verse 20. He says, For what purpose to me comes frankincense from Sheba and sweet cane from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices sweet to me. And this may cause you to scratch your head a little bit because who was it that instituted this service of sacrifices. It was God. Why is he telling them that I don't appreciate these services? Because they're going through the rounds of emotion. They're going through the motions of religion, and their heart isn't in it. And some of us just think, well, God said do these things, so if I do these things, I get out of jail. But guys, religion is so much more than that. A relationship with Jesus Christ is so much more than I'll just do these things to get God off my back. That's not what he wants. He wants your heart, beloved. He wants all of you. True worship is birthed out of an experience of gratitude for truly knowing God. Don't just show up to church on the right day and wear the right clothes and act really nice in front of other Christians. That's not what God wants from you. He wants more than that. He wants the real you. Jesus didn't die for the golden boy, the fake version of you. He died for the real version of you. So give him what he paid for. Amen? Let him have all of you. So he takes issue with these sacrifices because he truly wants their heart. And this is an indictment to us. Are we just going through the motions of religion? If so, it means nothing to God. Because he wasn't looking for stuff. He was looking for you. Are you with me? In Psalm 81, he picks up on the same idea. Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you. O Israel, if you will listen to me, there shall be no foreign God among you, nor shall you worship any foreign God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Does that sound like God wants to bless them? You better believe it. But my people would not heed my voice and they would have none of me. They want nothing to do with me. 
So I gave them over to their stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. I remember reading a statement some years ago that said, when God lets man have his own way, it's the darkest hour of his life. Can anyone testify to that? When God lets man have his own way, it's the darkest hour. When he lets you have what you want, go do you. It doesn't work, guys. It leads to some of the darkest and most terrible experiences of our life. So I turned you over to your decisions and the consequences of them. He continues in verse 13, Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies, and I would turn my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord would pretend submission to him, but their fate would endure forever. He would have fed them also with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock. I would have satisfied you. God wants to bless you guys. He wants to bless you, but we are stubbornly resisting his grace. We refuse to say yes to him. I want to do it my way. Let me get in the driver's seat. Well, how's that working out for you? Exactly. Why not place your trust in the one who has only always ever done what is in your best interest? You don't do what's in your best interest. You do what you want, but you don't do what's in your best interest. Neither do I. We struggle with this. And God is saying, I wish you would listen to me. I have something better to offer you, but you got to come. I need you to respond to me. I want to bless you, but you're cutting yourselves off from that blessing by rejecting me because I'm that true source of blessing. You can't sneak in some other way. In Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 6, Ezekiel's given these different visions and he's showing different things that are happening in the temple of God and it's abominable. It's terrible what's happening through the religious leaders of Israel. And in verse 6, it says, Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they're doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary? Now turn again and you will see even greater abominations. God literally is rendered homeless by the sins of his people. He can't live in his house and he can't live in our hearts. The only two temples that are a direct consequence for you and me, the house of God and his people. Do you not know that you yourselves are the temple of God, that the spirit of God dwells within you? When we continue to reject him and harden ourselves to his pleas and his petitions, he has to leave. Can you imagine? There's this heartbreaking scene in the book of Ezekiel where the presence of God elevates and goes to the threshold of the temple and then eventually departs. Can you, have you ever maybe been in a situation like that where you're trying to be there for somebody and you just have to hang your head and walk out in defeat? Well, that's God's experience. He's going to win the great controversy, but unfortunately, he's not going to win everybody's heart. And it's not because he didn't do enough. It's because they didn't want his rest. They didn't want his peace. I'd rather have the chaos that I've committed than to fully say yes to you. And it's devastating to him. He literally walks away when that door is finally closed and can't be opened ever again in the hearts of these individuals. And he's devastated. He did not want this result. But the almighty, all-powerful God of the universe at the end of the day is going to give people what they want because that's what love does. He will choose to not get what he wants, to give you what you want. But the good news is this evening, there's time for that to change because some of us hopefully are coming to realize that what I want is not in my best interest and I need something else. And he's willing to bear along with us. And then the consummation of his pursuit of his people all throughout the Old Testament is found in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37. As Jesus is leaving the temple for the last time and says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her, how often I wanted to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were willing. Beloved, this is not an issue of God's willingness. It's us. We're the problem. It's not that God almost succeeded in the plan of salvation. He just came a little bit short in so-and-so's life, in so-and-so's life. No, 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 no. He has perfectly succeeded. 
and we have completely seceded. We've stepped back. We've removed ourselves from the land of blessing. Seceded. We've, we've stepped back. We want our own country. We want our own rules. I want to do me. Fine. I know what this is going to do to you. But I can't go where I'm not welcome. And there will come a day where he has to leave for the last time. He doesn't want that. And this is why he doesn't leave. Because he wants to see you in the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Jesus weeps here over this city. He's crying when he says these words. But he weeps not only for what was, but for what could have been. I don't want that to be said about me. That Jesus wept over what could have become of my life. I don't want that. I know what I was before Jesus found me, and I don't want to go back there. I don't want him to weep for what could have been. I want him to rejoice over what is happening right now. The faith of Jesus weeps here. In Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 2, it says, I've stretched out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, again, according to their own thoughts. That striving for independence is what led to Lucifer's rebellion in the first place. And it's not doing anything for us, guys. We're not happy. We think if I can just be in control and do me and get mine, then I'll be happy. How many people in this room have actually turned out to be happy when they made those decisions? Exactly. It leads to shame and regret. It doesn't last. You don't truly find happiness by spitting in God's face and doing you. It's not possible. Not true rest for your soul. You might find, you know, certain chemicals in your body light up and go crazy, right? When we get our hit from the things that we run to. That's not happiness. That's a drug-induced chemistry change, right? In some form or fashion. That is not true rest and happiness. And this is the pleading of a fatherly love here. Imagine being a parent and you're watching your child destroy themselves day after day after day. And you plead with them as they're about to take their own lives. Don't do this. Son, put down the gun and just come home. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you are doing. Just come back. Only to watch them make the final decision and end their life. Beloved, this is a circumstance that God is unfortunately intimately acquainted with. He goes through this on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, pleading with people, only watching them seal their destiny. And it will involve them being outside of that city of the New Jerusalem. It's devastating them. God is a parent, guys. The very love you have for your children, that you would rather die than see them suffer. Why do you think Jesus came, guys? He would rather die than see you suffer. That's where you get it. You're reflecting the image of God when you have those impulses. But it's devastating to him to have to turn us over to these decisions. And, you know, we, ha we ask this question. We say, God, why do bad things happen? What we don't realize is God is asking the same question, but from a different perspective. Why would you reject my grace and be turned over to the consequences of sin? Why do you keep doing this? Why do you keep choosing that over me? All throughout the Old Testament, we see God pursuing his people at the expense of his own heart, at the expense of his own embarrassment, trying to win them over, and heartbroken and devastated, he continues nonetheless. But what is so mind-boggling to me is what the nation of Israel says in Isaiah chapter 49. It says, but Zion said, the people of God said, the Lord has forsaken me and my Lord has forgotten me. Are you kidding me? And that's basically God's response. Are you kidding me? He says, can a woman forget her nursing child? He's using strong emotional language here and not have compassion on the son of her womb, surely they may forget. That ain't happening, except in a few instances where mothers just have no compassion whatsoever. Surely they may forget. 
but I will not forget you, he says. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands, and your walls are continually before me. That is explicit Calvary language, beloved. If there is anything that shows us that God has not forgotten us, it's Calvary. Are you with me? If there's anything that tells us that God has not forgotten you, it's Calvary. How could you say something like that about me? Especially after all I've done for you and how long I've borne with you, especially in spite of how you've hurt me. He can't believe we would say such a thing, that God has rejected me and forsaken me. Nothing could be further from the truth, beloved. We get to Revelation chapter 3. There are seven churches in Revelation, and they represent different um, different time periods of church history from the disciples all the way until the second coming of Jesus. And in the seventh church, there's this problem. He says, you think that you're rich and have need of nothing, but you're poor, blind, miserable, and naked. You have a perception problem. You think you don't need anything, but nothing could be further from the truth. And then he says, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, a faith that works by love, Galatians tells us. White raiments, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, because you have no righteousness on your own. You do have a need. All of us do. None of us have anything to offer Jesus but ourselves, not our deeds. And thirdly, he says, I want to offer you eye salve that you may see. Spiritual discernment to recognize your true condition. And he's got a problem with this church, the church of Laodicea, because he says, I wish you were cold or hot, but you're not. You're neither cold nor hot, you're lukewarm. And it makes him want to vomit. I wish you would either be all out or all in, but this kind of in the middle thing, it's not working for me. It makes me sick, he says. And it's to this church in this context, that in verse 20 of Revelation 3, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. But the statement, Behold, I come, or I stand at the door and knock, in the Greek is in the continuative, which means that he has been knocking. He is knocking now and has no intention of not knocking tomorrow. Now, that has to make you think. Because the only reason why someone would stand and knock at a door day after day after week after week after month after year is because there's something of value on the other side of that door. Are you with me? Even if we have a religious experience that makes him want to vomit, he still sees something of value in us, guys. That's the only reason he would stand there making a fool of himself. Day after week, after month, after year, it's because he sees something in you that even you don't see in you. And that's why he won't leave, beloved. He loves you too much. He doesn't want to lose you. This is an artist's depiction here, but I want you to imagine with me a modern home today. And as you look at the front door of that home, there's cobwebs in the door jamb. It's clear that this door has not been opened for a long time. And as you see Jesus, and and the other thing you'll notice is that this door has no handle on the outside. Access can only be granted from within. And as you see Jesus knocking day after week, after month, after year, imagine what the neighbors are thinking. Look, man, they're obviously not home. And if they are, they certainly don't want to speak to you. You're wasting your time, man. Move on. And yet he keeps knocking and knocking and knocking. And I believe if you were to look into the face of Jesus, you would see at least two things. The first would be sadness. I wish I was in there. I know what I could do for them if they would let me into their lives. The other thing I think you would see is anticipation. 
Maybe they just can't hear me. Maybe they're not ready yet. So I'll keep knocking and knocking and knocking. And I'd be willing to guess tonight that some of us have heard him knocking. Some of us are hearing him knock right now. And we've struggled to let him in. What if he sees what I'm really like? You think he doesn't know? What if I say yes and I mess up? You think he doesn't know that either? Well, don't I like need to clean the house before he comes in? You think he doesn't know what a mess lies on the other side of that door? And beloved, the amazing thing is, he does know. In blatant honesty, you're way uglier than you think you are on the inside. You're, you're good looking people. But on the inside, it's way worse than even you realize, even though we're filled with shame and self-hatred. And yet he knows. And what is he doing with that knowledge? He's knocking on that door, guys, still. And he knows that you can't clean up the house. He knows the mess that you have made. He knows the mess that other people have made and that you have inherited. And he doesn't care because he knows what he's capable of doing if you let him in that house. And your depravity, your brokenness, your stubbornness is no match for the grace of Jesus Christ if you will let him in that house. Amen? Amen. It's no match for him. What is a match for him is our refusal to open the door. Some of us have let him in the front door. I'll let you be Savior, but I won't let you be God of all. And for some of us, he's knocking on doors inside of the house, and he's saying, hey, let's talk about this. I don't want to talk about that. Look, I want you in my life, but this far and no further, Jesus. He's saying, you don't understand. The only reason why I'm knocking on that door is because I know what I could do for you if you let me into that area of your life. I know what I could do for you if you let me into this area of your life. And for some of us, we're just afraid to go there. And he's pleading with us tonight. Please, trust that I can do for you what you clearly have not been able to do for you. Do you want things to change? He's only knocking on that door if he's offering us something better and a closer experience with himself. Remember, he says, if any man opens, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. That includes you, ladies. To dine and commune with the love of your life, Jesus Christ, is the sweetest experience you will ever have. Why say no? Why deadbolt that door and keep fighting? Let him in. Let him in. You know, Jesus can reason with us, and he can communicate and show us a better way, but the choice remains ours. He only works through love, and love has to allow for choice. So the most important question is, what are you going to do with the pleading of Jesus? Are you going to leave him outside? Or are you going to let him in? Scripture is clear. God is not going to give up on you. But there is going to come a point in time where he's going to have to yield to you giving up on yourself. And he doesn't want that. God does not want to lose you. This is what breaks his heart, and this is what brings him to tears. So the scriptures are clear. The Old and New Testament paint the same picture. Jesus says that he who has seen me has seen the Father. The very picture you see of Jesus in the Gospels is the same God of the Old Testament, it's the same God of the New Testament, and it's the same God that's knocking on your heart, on your heart tonight. Amen? It's the same God. 
And what was he like? Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus truly loved you to the end of himself, and he's going to truly love you to the end of your ability to make a right decision at the end of the day. He will truly love us to the end. So does God care? Yes. More than you'll ever know. Does God hurt when I hurt? Yes. You better believe it. And he hurts when you don't hurt. And he hurts all the time in this great controversy. And this is why God won't leave. And this is why he keeps pleading with the lost as long as he can. This is the response that God has to you and I saying no. And we have to see his side of the story before we say no. The whole point of the second coming of Christ is to pick up what he paid for. Well, let him have it, beloved. Let him have it. He paid for all and desires to receive all, but not all will respond to the faith of Jesus. So if we continue to resist the pursuit and pleading of God, what's going to happen? He's going to hurt for eternity. You know, our experience in being lost and going through the second death is actually easier than God's experience because it eventually ends. We eventually cease to exist. God doesn't have that option. He continues to have to live with that pain. Now, we don't know what that looks like, but in the same way that you and I see that empty seat at the table at Thanksgiving and Christmas, and we long for those people who are no longer with us, where do you think you got that from? That's you reflecting the image of God. Loss is meant to be foreign. It's meant to be. It's not what we were made for. And God is going to feel that more than all of us. And again, we don't know what that looks like, but I know it's real. We're told that Jesus will wipe our tears away in the book of Revelation, and I'm sure that he's going to find some form of closure himself. But that does not mean that that loss ever goes away. You know that, right? Even after Jesus has brought you comfort in your loss, there's still that sense that something's missing. Don't let that be you, guys. Don't let you be the one that he misses. So the appeal for salvation isn't just an appeal to put it into your pain. It's an appeal to put it into his When he's pleading with you to say yes to Jesus, it's not just an appeal to put it into your pain, though he wants that. It's also an appeal to put it into his. Are you with me? I'd like for them to play a song here. As this song is being played, I want you to think about where you are right now. And I want you to think about what door Jesus is knocking on right now that he's asking you to respond to. So as you're hearing this song that my friend Neville sings, I want you to reflect upon that. Before I sing this song, I just want to share a little bit about it. It's a song that's written in the form of a story. And it's a, a song talking about the pain that one feels when they go to heaven looking for someone that they thought was there and found out that they wasn't there. Now I know all of us have people that we desire to see there and so as I sing this song just think about them and also think about yourself as well and where you stand with Jesus. Listen. I dreamt I went to heaven last night there were many mansions up there what a wonderful sight then i saw a door with your name and something else written in red it said this one's empty he wanted the world instead tears 
was in heaven. I know Jesus will wipe them away. And when I was crying, in his gentle voice I heard him say, there's a void in my heart I wish you could see. I wanted him right here with me. And now I know why there will be tears in heaven. There were many searching for family and friends up and down the streets of gold from end to end. Then I saw the books with your name and all of the secrets you hide. And the tears came again as I saw all the times Jesus tried. Tears in heaven. I know Jesus will wipe them away. And when I was crying, in his gentle voice I heard him say, there's a void in my heart I wish you could see. I wanted him right here with me. And now I know why there will be tears in heaven. I'm so glad that it was only just a dream. It was only a dream. While there's still just a little bit more time, use it wisely. Don't hesitate to make up your mind. Very soon there'll be no more chances, and it will be time to destroy. And I want to be standing with you, crying tears of joy, tears in heaven. I know Jesus will wipe them away. And while we are crying, in his gentle voice we'll hear him say, I'm so glad that you're here together with me. Living forever and free. And now I know why there will be. Now I know why there will be. Now I know why there will be tears in heaven. There'll be tears of sorrow and tears of joy in heaven. God bless you. God bless you. Again, the appeal for salvation is not just an appeal to put an end to your pain. It's an appeal to put in into His. As you grab your cards to respond this evening in our appeal, number one says, I want to put an end to God's pain and fully say yes to Him. If that's you, I invite you to check box one. Number two, there's an unopened door in my heart and I want to open that to Him. That's you, check box two. Number three, I want to commit to sharing these beautiful truths I've been learning with the people around me and put an end to their pain. That's you, check box three. Number four, I want to be baptized or rebaptized. You can check that box. And then number five, if you have any questions or prayer requests, you can write those in the lines in the front. 
I carry over to the back. But I have to ask, has this made sense this evening? Yes or no? There's a God of love in the Old Testament and the New Testament, beloved. And his heart is broken at the lack of response he's receiving, though he's giving everything he's got. And I hope and pray that no one in this room is going to have to hear him say, what more could I have done for you? I hope that we can hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we've heard you clearly tonight. Father in heaven, we've seen your heart born clearly. And the Spirit of God is also being active and working on our behalf. And Lord, we don't want to harden ourselves to you anymore. Lord, whatever it takes, whatever we've been holding back and keeping to ourselves for a rainy day when we're eventually ready to go there, Lord, I pray that we would recognize there's no better day to go there than today. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be wide open to you. As the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians, Behold, our hearts are wide open before you, so you also be open. Lord, we've seen that your heart is open, and I pray that we would reciprocate tonight. I pray that you would cover our sins with the blood of Jesus, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, and that you would give us the courage, the strength, and to trust that the only reason why you're knocking on those doors is because you're offering us a deeper and sweeter experience with yourself, and you're offering us something better. Oh God, help us say yes tonight. This is our plea, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tomorrow night, our final message is going to be the topic, Jesus understands. Look forward to seeing you then.